demand of water is growing very quickly. The dotted line is showing our water supply. So the water in those rivers and lakes is actually going to be less over that time because of sedimentation. So if there's bare soil on your property, what happens when it rains is that water ends up, uh, that mud ends up in the water and it settles out in creeks and rivers and lakes. And each one of those will gradually over time build up with a quarter of an inch, quarter inch at a time. And so lakes hold less water. Most of our lakes are 60 to 70 years old now. And so that's a lot of water that builds up at the bottom. So that's kind of what that's talking about. Also aging infrastructure, the older pipes get the less water they can move. So we actually, that's a, a further driving factor for us to utilize rainwater and other um, sources of water uh, like uh, gray water that actually is used to water this landscape outside, uh, which, is, which is interesting. Uh, drought in Texas also drives that. So anybody new to Texas or relatively new to Texas? I say that's a rude question to ask because if you're a Texan, you've probably heard this bad joke before, but if you're a Texan, then they'll tell everybody you're a Texan in the first five minutes you meet them. If you're not, then that's just bragging to somebody else. You don't want to throw people under the bus, of course. Uh, that's just going to be silly. Uh, but, but you know, Texas is, is a place where we're pretty used to drought. So if we go back, you know, the past five years, 10 years, we've seen multiple periods where we have less than 15 or 50% of rainfall in a given period of time. And so if we're used to getting 36 inches of rainfall in a year, we may see some years where we only see 18 inches of rainfall. And so a lot of people say when we're in a drought, well, there's no rainwater to harvest, so what's the point of harvesting rainwater? But really what I would say is it's more of a factor to actually capture it when it is falling, and then that will allow us to use that water during those dry periods. In fact, on average, we actually get more water that falls on our roofs. If we capture every drop of water that falls on our roof in Frisco, it would exceed the demand of the water that the city of Frisco uses for municipal water. Does that make sense? So we're actually given water falling from the sky that we can take advantage of that we would we could reduce what we're planning and processing. So the, the uh, most recent Texas State Water Plan called for us to increase from 34% conservation to 45% conservation. So what that means is that we are building new lakes and that's great, but that the water demand that is gonna come in the next 50 years is gonna just be from us saving 45% of that water. That's their plan anyway. So <laughs> what they're gonna, what's ultimately gonna happen is the price of water is gonna go up and they're gonna start fining people for wasting water until we can get down to that. So it just makes sense, you know, to, to actually get in with the program before that, practice conservation. So uh, you're, you'll build resiliency in your own landscape. I'm gonna kind of go a little bit quickly through this, but this is basically just showing the other part of harvesting rainwater. You can actually de defer or deter what would be going down the sidewalk in the driveway when we get a rain event. So the water comes so fast and it's got all these impervious surfaces that the majority of water that lands in our landscape is actually running off down storm drains, is causing flooding problems. Uh, also within it causes pollution. So if we imagine what Frisco looked like 200 years ago and it rained, 50% of the water would actually go into the ground, 10% runs off and 40% goes in the atmosphere to receive cloud. Now if we have a city, what happens when it rains? Well, where can those raindrops go? They hit the tops of roofs, they hit the parking lots, the driveways, the sidewalks, and they can't actually go into the ground. So now we only see 15% of the water actually infiltrate. We see 55% of the water run off. That's when we see more flooding problems, the more an area develops. And that creates a little bit of a challenge in the volume of water that's running off, but also that our fertilizers, our pesticides, anything we're putting on the landscape. One of the largest contributors to stormwater pollution is fecal bacteria from cats and dogs. It's kind of gross to think about, but all that ends up in our creeks, our rivers, our lakes, where we get our drinking water from. So if we could actually put some of that water into this barrel, then that water in the barrel is clean. It's not gonna pick up those pathogens and uh, we can actually use that in our landscapes. So then it's gonna stay in sync without picking up all those pollutants, especially uh, if we're using it during those dry times. Now, 
The American Associ Association of Landscape Architects, every few years they do a study and they ask people like, what are the trends in landscape design? And really the cool thing is we are seeing more and more people interested in using efficient irrigation, reduced lawn areas, using uh, almost 70% of Americans are interested in incorporating rainwater harvesting. So you may not have thought it tonight, but y'all are the cool kids. Y'all are y'all are in with the trend coming out and in about rainwater harvesting. Uh, so what, really the ultimate goal tonight is just to kind of think a little bit about your water footprint, what you're doing. Certainly, I think it's already something you've, you've thought about if you're interested in, in setting up a rain barrel yourself. But uh, one thing that is important once you start harvesting rainwater, it's really, this is a tool for people to get greedy. So it's crazy how greedy people will get once they have one of these, because you'll see how quickly the rain barrel fills up. And if it rains tonight, you know, you may actually have some rainwater in your barrel, which is great. But in just a little rainfall event, once you hook these up, the barrel will be full and then you'll use your barrel and it provides water for about a 10 foot by 10 foot area. And you may found out like, hey, this is going faster than I thought it would. I want to get another rain barrel and another rain barrel. And people tie them into series and a lot of times people graduate to a 250 gallon barrel and a 500 gallon barrel. I have a, a thousand gallon barrel and then you really start to think, okay, I can save this much water in my sister, but how much water can I save if I just mulch and compost my landscape? Or maybe if I build a rain garden, or how much water can I actually absorb in the soil? And there's a lot more water you can harvest in your soil than you can in a finite resource like a barrel. So it's really kind of just digging into uh, the first step. And maybe we're saying we're getting our toes wet. Uh, the, the puns are kind of hit or miss there. <laughs> So some of the benefits, it reduces that demand on municipal water that we talked about. It makes efficient use of a valuable resource. It can help us reduce flooding, erosion, and contamination of the surface water. Um, but if you don't care about going green and saving blue, what a lot of people care about is saving green. If so you can save money on your water bill, uh, then that makes sense, especially if maybe you're growing vegetables or other plants that are maybe a little bit higher water users. So the next time you see clouds like that outside, you can just think of money falling from the sky. Now, I mentioned there's different types of rainwater harvesting. There is passive, which means we're trying to slow, sink, and spread the water into the ground. And there are several ways we can do that. In fact, we have a class on uh, rain gardens, a virtual class on rain gardens that is happening next Friday um, that you may be interested in checking out. Um, but basically that's using the landscape to store the water, which is a great uh, resource. When we're harvesting with a barrel or a cistern, we're actually storing that actively. We call that active rainwater harvesting. Uh, we can do that through tank-based systems. You can use the water for irrigation, landscape water. Some people use them for pet wildlife. In fact, I had a dog who lived for 17 years and rainwater was the only water that, that she ever really drank or it can actually be used for in-home use. Now, that is with larger cisterns that are uh, clean to drinking water standards. So if you have a larger cistern like this, you probably wouldn't want to use your rain barrel to clean to drinking water standards. You have to have pre-filtration. Um, you have to have UV filtration to actually make sure it's clean. Some people will actually chlorinate it. So you don't want to drink the water out of your barrel. However, there are other systems you can design where you actually could drink that water too. Um, and some people actually had their water shut off in February. So that may be uh, a resource that you may want to look into. Now, there's different components of rainwater harvesting. One of the ways um, that, that we help determine how much water that we can capture is through the su supply, which is for most people going to be from their roof. So we're actually catching the raindrops that fall on the roof. We're going to divert it into the barrel. We're going to store it for the next time we use, uh, we, you know, we need to use the water. Um, but rainwater harvesting is not a new technology. In fact, <clears throat> if you've ever been to the Four Rivers Fountain in Rome, it's actually still filled up by rainwater. Um, and it was formerly Constantinople, the Stoa Basilica at the bottom, uh, has a cistern at the bottom. Um, this, uh, in Portugal, this cistern, oh no, this is uh, built by the Port Portuguese, but this one is in Morocco. A lot of their buildings they actually use to capture rainwater beneath the building. Uh, Bill and Melinda Gates actually use that technology in uh, their uh, foundation's building in, in Seattle. 
uh, but it's a way of life for a lot of people all over India, all over Africa. People uh, utilize rainwater. In fact, my, my master's uh, project at Texas Tech, I lived in Kenya for a short time, um, the Turkana region, I get about five inches of rainfall a year. And so just typically in two to three rainfall events, and so they want to capture every drop of water that falls on their property uh, so they can utilize that for drinking water, for showers, cooking, what have you. Uh, so that's part of the thing is we're looking at how much we can capture by how many raindrops actually fall on the roof and your, your roof footprint will determine that. We'll look on some uh, calculations a little bit later. Uh, and then we have to get it into the barrel. We do that through gutters or downspouts. Now you don't have to have a gutter or a downspout, but it's really the easiest way to deliver water in the barrel. We'll talk about some alternatives going forward. And then the storage is really just your barrel or your cistern. So those three components, your catchment, which is your roof, your conveyance, which is your gutters and downspouts, and your storage, which is going to be your barrel or cistern. Now, if you did have a large system and you wanted to drink it, you would need some type of filtration system. But for a rain barrel, we don't really need that because we're just going to use the water for our plants. Now, the cost. Uh, typically, a DIY barrel like this can cost you 50 cents to $1.50 a gallon. Uh, if you wanted to get a larger cistern, like through the mail, like sometimes they have the big poly tanks, they're going to be $1 to $4 a gallon. If you actually want somebody to install it themselves, it's, you're looking at $5.50 to $15 a gallon. So really, DIY doing it yourself does make a lot of sense. And a lot of times people want to actually figure out how they can harvest water in cisterns undergrowth. Maybe they don't look like the look of the cistern. Those are significantly higher. And for most residential purposes, those are cost prohibitive at up to $30 uh, a gallon. So captured rainwater, we can use it for uh, any reason we would use water around plants. The benefits are that it's salt free. Our water that comes out of the tap, tap actually has added salt. So what that does is prevent um, leaching of minerals from the pipes into the water. It's also chlorine free. So uh, all of our city water is going to have either chlorine or chloramines in it to keep the bacterial load down so we don't get sick from drinking the water. That can be problematic for some of our plants, especially our tropical plants and our salt uh, sensitive plants. Uh, you may also notice that sometimes uh, there's calcium deposits, uh, like maybe in your shower, around your shower heads, your faucet. Sometimes that can be problematic to plants, and so rainwater is calcium, it's lime free. Um, some areas that have more acidic soils, we have problems with lime. Uh, pH is slightly below seven, so we have high pH soils. Our plants, most of them, actually prefer lower pH. So one of the things rainwater does is it helps buffer the pH around our plants where we don't necessarily get that with city water. City water tends to be more alkaline. So there's really a lot of reasons uh, that we, that we would want to use it. But we want to make sure that we can gain those benefits uh, by keeping the water as clean as it is going in so it will be clean coming out. We'll talk about ways uh, that we can do that. Now, you'll notice on all your barrels today, they will have a mosquito netting on here. This is just a vinyl insect netting. The reason we use vinyl is because the metal stuff rusts, and so this is last, last you know, five to 10 years on these, depending on um, kind of you know, where it is in terms of sunlight, and if there's anything blowing around that can kind of damage it. In addition to keeping mosquitoes from going and breeding in your barrel, this will filter out any debris that is large debris that is falling from your roof. So we'll talk about we need to clean and maintain our gutters, but if there's anything that is not uh, you know, cleaned out in the gutter, any debris that comes out there, that will keep it from going out in, into the barrel. So it keeps it clean and nice. Again, it is not uh, for drinking water, so you'll notice there are some animals that do what they do on our roof. Uh, and so we want to make sure that there are, there can be fecal bacteria that builds up in there. If birds or um, squirrels are doing their business on our roof, uh, but it's perfectly fine for plants. Now, there's two times a year that we really kind of want to think about keeping our water clean. The first one is in the spring. If you have any oak trees nearby or you have any pecan trees, you'll notice the male flowers or the catkins. It's really not that big of a deal, but if that builds up on your roof and in your gutters, uh, sometimes that will leach into your barrel. It's, uh, there's a lot of pollen in there, and that pollen is slightly acidic, 
it also will start to stink a little bit. Sometimes you'll notice like pollen smells a little musky or manly. Uh, we don't want any smells like that in our barrel. So what you can do is clean those off as soon as they fall on, or you can just open your water while those are falling, and then the next rainfall event, it should flush it all out, and then you'll be fine. The other thing you'll notice on here is leaves. So in the fall, when there's a lot of leaves that are falling in our gutters, now I have a gutter guard, and that keeps um, all that stuff out of, of my gutters. Uh, but if those build up, you want to go ahead and clean that out as quickly as, as possible. It's not a super big deal, but really one of the ways we can keep the water in our barrel clean and free of any smells is to keep any organic matter out. And the pollen from the catkins and little debris from our leaves can, can uh, create um, just little particles of organic matter that goes in there. A lot of times it will settle out in the bottom and be no problem at all. But if it does build up, you want to make sure you just clean it out so you don't get any off smells. And 90% of the time, there would be no issue with any of that. Uh, following up, we just want to say we're all about green roofs, but these are not the type of green roofs that we're talking about there. Uh, and again, just a warning that this water is not potable. It's not for uh, drinking water use. And maybe it's, unless maybe it's like the zombie apocalypse and you get a boil it and filter it out or something like that. Um, but for the most part, we want to caution you against doing that. You can use it for irrigation. You can use it for foundation watering. You can use it for house plants. If you've ever seen house plants doing something like this, a lot of times it's because of the salt and the chlorine in our, our water. They're very sensitive to that. Now, most plants outside, it's really not that big of a deal, but our interior plants will notice that. And it's remarkable if you start to use rainwater how a lot of your tropical interior plants just come back to life and, and look as good as they ever had. You can also use it in ponds and aquariums if you're interested. You can use it in bird baths. In fact, somebody that took a class uh, sent this picture to us. These are cedar wax wings. Um, this is one of our barrels kind of hooked up. You can see there. Uh, but outside of this picture, she had a brand new uh, rain, uh, brand new um, bird bath. In that bird bath, she put a little bit of city water in and then got just a quarter of an inch of rain. And you'll notice there is a little bit of water that is just kind of resting in this lip right here, just a little bit. And that's where the birds are getting their birth bath, not in the actual uh, bird bath. Um, Patch water bowl, I mentioned that. You can also use them the wildlife guzzlers. My buddy has a big ranch and we've set up some of these with catchment devices to actually um, fill up water for, you know, it could be deer or you know, pigs or dove or whatever you're trying to hunt. Um, so that there is some benefit there as well as to wildlife. I mentioned a little bit about uh, uh, how much water we can actually calculate or, or how much water will fall on a roof, but we can actually calculate it right here. And I think you're probably going to be blown away. So on average, we can harvest a, about a half a gallon per square foot uh, of roof in a one inch rainfall event. The average home around this area has about a 2,000 square foot roof footprint. It doesn't actually matter what size or shape your roof is, just what the footprint uh, where the water drops fall. So in a one inch rainfall event, a 2,000 square foot roof could harvest 1,200 gallons of water. So if these are 55 gallon drums, right, you can be filling these up multiple times in a rainfall event, even if you had one on each downspout at each side of your house. If we look at that in a 34 inch rainfall year, which was uh, what we got last year, uh, then 40,000 gallons of water in a year, that's actually a lot of water that would otherwise be going down the storm drain you know, going on the creeks and ca causing flooding problems, you can save that in barrels or cisterns. Now there's a tool, you may wanna write this down or maybe just open up a browser on your phone and check it out. But this website, one of my buddy owns, it's uh, permadesign.com, it's out of New Mexico. Uh, but he has the best tool for estimating your rainwater use. Uh, you just go to his website, permadesign.com. He doesn't get any money for it, it's free. Um, but you, you go to roof water calculator and then you enter your address. And so then your house will pop up right here and you'll go to the draw right there in the middle of the screen and you'll just drop a dot on each corner of your house and your roof footprint may look kind of funky or different than this one. 
but that will measure the, the, the footprint of your roof line. And then because it has your zip code, it will automatically, and they don't send you anything or it's not you know, intrusive, but they'll know how much rainfall on average you get in that area. And so it will automatically harvest or calculate your rainwater harvesting potential. So this roof footprint right here is 830 square feet. And in a 36 inch rainfall average here, that means we can harvest 44,000 gallons of water. Um, now you're not gonna harvest all that in this 55 gallon barrel, but it's just estimating the potential rainwater harvesting that you can use. So I mentioned gutters and downspouts. That's really the easiest way to deliver water into our barrel. But if you don't have gutters or downspouts, what you'll notice is in a rainfall event, the water is going to end up in your roof valleys and it's going to actually come down in a deluge. In fact, if we looked at the bottom between either one of those pictures, we just did a video and I used my own house, for example, in the front where we don't have a gutter, the water comes out right there and I have kind of a little rain garden. Um, but all the mulch in a very heavy rainfall event, all the mulch washes away and sometimes there's bare soil. That is a perfect spot to put a rain barrel if you don't have gutters. So and you can kind of see uh, in this picture right there where it would be. So what I would do is just put a couple bags of decomposed granite or gravel there to prevent that from washing away more. Then put some cinder blocks or some kind of uh, something to level the bottom there and then put my rain barrel there and then you'll be good to go and every time it rains the rain water will go inside the barrel and you don't have to really be exact right so we talked about in a one inch rainfall event you could potentially harvest 1200 gallons of water and we split that into maybe your house has four downspouts that means that 300 gallons would be coming on that one you know roof valley to that side of a house that is enough to overflow this thing multiple times. And so whether you have like your, your, your uh, downspout, the water's coming this way, and it's here or here or here or wherever, slightly off, just if, you know, half of the water or a third of the water is coming inside this barrel, it's plenty to over, overflow your barrel, no problem. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the components that go into building these barrels. We kind of already have it built for you. We've taught these classes in the past where uh, we actually uh, let you put the mosquito screen on and let you put the faucet on. And because of COVID, we've kind of steered uh, a little bit away from that. We've had people take these, these classes and they come with their whole tool bag and bring their extension cord and their drills. Uh, but it's less DIY now and, and more just learning about the process. But we also want you to know that if you want to do this yourself, if you want an additional barrel, we have them for you for $55. But if you did want to create them, you could do that um, on your own. So first thing we start with the barrel, um, we get these um, from a local beverage distributor. You'll notice right here, this is what they do to it. <laughs> so, and I probably shouldn't say this, uh, but I'm going to. So these are labels from that beverage distributor and they cover it off because they don't want the, your secret recipe, their secret recipe for making their soda to be in here. But this is just soda syrup. Sometimes they have a, uh, a label on there that says caution, caustic. Uh, and people are like, what is this? I thought you said it was a food, food grade barrel. I'm like, it's just because pure soda syrup is so concentrated that it actually is caustic and you have to be careful with it. But it's like, you know, this is like, if you ever, you know, worked in a bar or restaurant, the guns that, you know, they add the, the, the carbonated water to it. This is just a concentrated form of, of that stuff. So you, you may even notice inside the barrel, they, some may have like a smell like, you know, orange soda or, you know, maybe some are, are strawberry soda or pina colada or, you know, cola, what have you. Um, but that's what was in there and sometimes you can actually tell which one. Uh, then we also, um, so the first thing we do here is we actually drill a hole in the barrel. We drill a pilot hole and then we cut around it and then we put our mosquito net there. So we just use a drill and just a regular old uh, jigsaw. We also use a bulkhead. You'll notice the bulkhead is like this one kind of back on the, the stool so you can see it. Initially, you'll see some different types of barrels that just where the faucet goes inside the barrel and has a washer on the back. Those work, but what we found is, you know, uh, 
over 10 years, 20 years, it gets hot, cold, hot, and cold, sometimes that will spring a leak. And if your faucet leaks, well, you're not actually gonna hold any water in your barrel. So what this bulkhead does is just marries the metal faucet to the plastic of the barrel. And these be out in you know, freezing temperatures, negative two degrees, you know, no problem, anything like that. Um, and that just keeps that seal sturdy so they won't leak. We also, you'll notice we'll have a metal faucet and the reason we have a brass faucet is because this is Texas. Some barrels you'll see have a plastic faucet, and we've noticed those that they last maybe you know two years or so, and then they just they disintegrate um, because of the heat and the cold and the sunlight. Um, we also put Teflon tape on there. You'll notice a little bit of white tape that just helps the brass faucet go into the bulkhead more smoothly. There's our mosquito netting. Any. Uh, mosquito netting would work for that. The main goal is to keep mosquitoes from breeding in your barrel, but also you don't want that debris going into your barrel. We want to keep that organic matter out as much as possible. The way that we attach uh, the mosquito screen through the top is just wear some clear uh, caulking. So this is silicone caulking, um, the same that you would put around your windows. It dries clear. Uh, it's paintable. If you wanted to paint your barrel, no issue there. So this just shows where we're getting our barrels. Uh, we get hundreds of these at a time. Um, we are keeping them out of the landfill, which is normally where they would be going. So we think that's great. They're also extremely sturdy. So you'll, you'll feel these barrels are relatively stout. Some commercial barrels are kind of like trash can type material. They kind of have some flex, flex to them. Something that can be a problem with freezing weather. But again, thin plastic, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold after five years. Sometimes they can crack, especially if they're bigger on the top than on the bottom. If they tip over, then it's easier for them to crack. But these are thrown around in a warehouse. They're extremely durable. They can handle, you know, when they're full of syrup, they can hold, you know, hundreds of, of gallons of syrup. Yes, sir. So it's okay to paint the outside, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure, 100%. We'll actually talk about that in the future, but yeah, no problem. This is HDPE plastic. It's high density polyethylene. It's the same plastic that, that your milk comes in. So we, you know, drink out of milk jugs kind of our whole life. Uh, for the most part, uh, but yeah, it's easy to paint. Uh, typically, we rough it up a little bit first, and then we use any paint uh, that we you would use on plastic works well for those. But this is us just just kind of tracing a hole. We have a five-inch hole at the top. <clears throat> Some people say, "Why don't you put the hole in the middle?" We used to. Uh, we've been doing this for a, for a long time, and I think this is we're getting close to twenty thousand barrels. It's like eighteen or nineteen thousand right now. But if we put them in the middle and your downspout was right here, then that would work great. But if your downspout ended up being right here where you had to have it, you wouldn't have a lot of flexibility. But if we have it on one side, then you can turn your barrel here, boom. If your downspout's here, oh, we just turn it here. So it just adds a little bit more flexibility um, uh, to, to do that. Uh, then that's us drilling our pilot hole. If you're really good, you can just drop a jigsaw into anything, but it's easier to do that pilot hole. So we do that. We just have a blade on there that's good for cutting plastic. <clears throat> we remove that plug. And then we uh, put the barrel on its side and we drill an inch and a half inch hole at the bottom and that is going to hold our, uh, our bulkhead right here. Now we use this really incredible piece of technology <laughs> that is a yardstick with duct tape in it. Because we have a smaller hole, one of the reasons we have a smaller hole, the old school barrels used to be completely open at the top. The reason we have a smaller hole is it's less water lost to evaporation. Also, there's less a chance that mosquitoes and debris can get inside the barrels. So we have just enough for the water to go in, but that's too small a hole for my fat arm to fit in there. So what we've done is we've uh, put the yardstick in there so we can get the bulkhead out there. And that kind of just extends so all those on. lids don't come off. These lids do not come off. In fact, really, you know, one of the reasons that that is a true reason, but it's almost impossible to find those barrels where the entire lid comes off these days. You can find, well, I mentioned soda syrup, but also you can find companies that had olives or pickles or snow cone syrup use these same type of, of barrels. But I will say, in all seriousness, um, it would be hard pressed for you, to certainly do it, but it would be hard pressed for you to find all the components 
and build the barrel for less than, than $55. But I would encourage you to do so um, as just kind of a fun project. And that's us putting the bulkhead on. That's what the bulkhead looks like. We wrap the faucet with Teflon tape and then we screw it in there. And it's a pretty simple process there. Now I want to warn y'all, most of y'all should already have the faucets turned off. But we've had people take this class before and they get really excited, they go home and they set up their barrel and it rains and it's like a kid on Christmas morning and you show up and there's no presents under the tree. Um, and they call us and they're like, my barrel didn't fill up with water and what is the, what are y'all trying to pull on us? And we're like, hey, did you turn the faucet off in the off position? And they're like, oh, oh, let me go check. I'll call you back. And nobody ever calls back. Um, that really did happen one time. I'm mostly being funny. But yeah, we want to make sure that it's turned off so then the water fills up. If it's open just a little, then the water will fill up and it'll gradually just drain out. So always make sure that the faucet is in the off position. Um, and then that's just us putting the silicone on the top. We just use a, a napkin to kind of brush it in there so that, that, that uh, mosquito netting stays. And this is the part that we used to do hands on in this class, but we've already done it for you. And then it dries clear. I wanted to kind of touch a little bit on how we actually hook these up. There's a few different ways to do it. Um, most of the time people see pictures like this and the problem with hooking up a downspout directly into your barrel is what happens when that barrel is full in this case. So if the barrel was full, <laughs> the water would just continue to back up in the gutter. The reason we don't want to do that is because if water stands in the gutter, it's going to be a lot of weight. Well, does anybody know how much one gallon of water weighs? Eight yeah, about eight pounds. So if your gutters were holding, you know, hundreds of pounds of water, that could actually throw them off kilter and then they wouldn't actually direct water away. So we don't want to do that. Even if you put an overflow on here, which some people say, no rain barrels have to have an overflow. Well, the reason why that doesn't really work in Texas where we are, imagine if you put an overflow that was the size of a water hose, but you have a three or four inch gutter coming in here. If this fills up, the garden hose is only going to take you know water away at a three quarter inch opening the water volume of water coming in is going to be greater than that so it's still going to overflow from the top anyway you would have to have a four inch overflow in order for the water to exit the barrel at the same time as it enters the barrel so what we've done is design these barrels they are actually meant to overflow during a rainfall event. We make sure that we install them where they're level, front to, front to back, left to right. And so if the water overflows from the barrel, it's fine. We wanna make sure that it's going away from the house. Certainly, um, if you didn't have gutters on a house, you wouldn't want there to be standing water. If you do have gutters on a house, you don't want there to be standing water. If you're harvesting rainwater or if you're not harvesting rainwater, you don't want there to be standing water, but all houses should be designed where there's at least a one inch grade over a hundred feet that's gonna carry that water away from your home. So if it's overflowing here, it really doesn't make a difference. It's still gonna to continue to drain away from your house. So we wanna make sure that it's doing that. So the way we get the water into the barrel, the easiest way is to remove your downspout from your gutters if you have them. Some gutters have a little screw that you just have to unscrew. Some have a rivet. You know what a rivet is? The easiest way to get rid of a rivet is just to drill the center out. It'll pop right out. Then you can take that section of gutter off. Really, you just need to get that downspout somewhere above your barrel. It doesn't mean matter if it's right here, or if it's right here, or where it is, but it just needs a point where the water can actually go into the barrel and there's a little bit of a gap. Now, there are some seamless gutters where they're actually, they're, this, the way they're built, they don't actually have a screw to unscrew. In that case, you need to cut them with a hacksaw. Just be careful, it's relatively easy. Anybody can do it. So you can see here where a normal downspout is. You can see this one, we removed that section. And then we just put a flexible gutter extender. You can find these at any hardware store. You put a little screw or maybe uh, just a little faster wire at the top and then you direct the water into your barrel. And really that's the easiest way to do it. You kind of see the before and the after right there. You can also use the same piece of guttering that you have. So you may have a little boot or an elbow at the bottom of your, your, um, 
little uh, downspout, you could actually just flip that and uh, bend it just a little bit to direct water into your barrel if you want to kind of hardwire it in. Um, really, it's just uh, the main thing is you want to make sure that the water is going into your barrel. And there's s several different ways to do it. There's a lot of YouTube videos to walk you through the process. One way that's fun to do that is through a rain chain. These are relatively inexpensive, you know, less than $50 or so, and it's more of a decorative way to deliver the water through your barrel. We see a lot of those around. Uh, they're very popular. Some of them actually use a literal chain. Water wants to go with the path of least resistance. You may have heard of the adhesion and cohesion of water. Have you ever studied science in school? But adhesion means that water tends to stick to stuff. If we put a drop of water, in some classes I do it, but if we put a drop of water on this table and we kind of go like this, you'll notice the water kind of sticks to the table as well. Cohesion means the water droplets stick to itself. And that's why rain chains work is because they want to go with least path, path of least resistance and they're just going to kind of trickle down. The cool thing about a rain chain is, so if you put the rain chain on the gutter and you just with a little screw attach the bottom of the rain chain to the barrel, if your downspout is here, you can move your barrel over here and the water is going to go on the rain chain because the water goes the path of least resistance. Almost defies gravity. You think it would just keep going, but that's not the way it works. It wants to go here. So if you have that, rain chain is nice because you have some variability if you need to go like two, two feet in either direction, uh, which is pretty cool. This is just the, how it kind of works right there. The water just kind of trickles down off the rain chain. Now you can uh, tie your rain barrels in series. I know a couple people are getting multiple rain barrels tonight. Uh, there's several ways to do that. Uh, well, notice right here that if you do it on the top, which you certainly can do, then the water drops. My pointer doesn't really show up right here, but if you imagine the downspout is on the top of the left barrel, if you can make that out. The raindrops, if they go here, that barrel would have to fill all the way up, and then the overflow goes to the next barrel. The water fills from the bottom up, and then it goes to the next barrel. Um, and you can do that, and I think that's a great way to do it if you want to use all of the barrels independently of each other. So if you had a faucet on this one, a faucet on this one, and a faucet on this one, you would use the water all independently. If you're tying them up into series and you want to use all 55 gallons together at the same time, so that's 110, 165 gallon weight, I don't know what my math, 55 times three, uh, then, then that you could use all that water at once. Maybe you want to water a raised bed or a larger area, that would make sense. So uh, if we think about it that way, then the water would fill up this one, these are tied together, it would fill up the bottom, and then it would go over to this one, and then they would fill at rel relatively the same time. <clears throat> you can use either method, it just depends on how you wanna kinda of use your barrel right here. Many times the way that we'll do that is we'll put a hose splitter here. We'll put a, a you know, it just goes from being one faucet to two faucets and has a shut off on either one, and then we'll hook them through a hose on this side and then whether you have that hose splitter open or shut that will allow you to use them independently of each other or to use that all together uh, but there's there's different ways to do it you can see this person kind of hard piped it in i'm sorry sir i don't mean to block you uh, but you can hard pipe a bit they have uh five six barrels in series here and they have shut offs so they could either just run one barrel they could run two barrels they could run you know the third barrel from the end and the fourth barrel from this end and they could, you know, just whatever one they wanted to use. So the more components and fittings you have, the more expensive the setup. So simple setups are, are, are more expensive and the more complex set setups are, are, are more complicated. If you are gonna have an overflow on your barrel, uh, especially if it's on the top, we recommend having it just a little bit bigger so that allows you to fill up the additional barrels quicker. But again, if you're getting, you know, 1,200 gallons and that's, you know, 300 gallons coming on this side of the house, that's plenty to fill up all those barrels and then, and then some, especially if you live in an area where you get significant rainfall. But that just kind of shows that set up there. Uh, just another um, connection. They've got a bulkhead and then a larger hose. A lot of times that's a similar hose to what we, you would use for a washing machine over. And then this shows what we typically set up with the hose and the splitters at the bottom. But either one of them works. This is another setup somebody's done with PVC pipes. And I mentioned the problem here is 
if, if water is eight pounds a gallon, and these are 55 gallons, and they have one, two, three, four, that's a lot of weight on an old piece of wood. So, you know, if you want to stack them that way, just, just uh, make sure you're doing it safely. These people have really gone all out. Now I will say, by the time you bought all those barrels and all those fittings and all that PVC, you probably could have just bought a 500 gallon cistern, but I mean, they did it one, one piece at a time, Johnny Cash style. You can see here, uh, like I mentioned on the left, you can see the overflow, but if the overflow is not as big as the inlet, it's still gonna overflow from the top. So really by design, if you just know that your barrel is gonna overflow, but you've graded to where the water's gonna go away from your house, then essentially just the top of the barrel is the overflow. The benefit that we find, again, we set up like 18,000 of these, that when it overflows from here, it actually is self-cleaning. It will clean any debris off that mosquito netting. You may have heard of rainwater harvesting first flushes. They're just devices that help uh, kind of take away any dirt that would be on the first initial uh, rainfall, like the first quarter of an inch of a rainfall event. But because the water is churning, it's dilution. Have you ever heard of the solution to pollution as dilution? The majority of the time when people say that, it's silly and you shouldn't take that into account. But in this case, it actually is true. If there was a little bit of bird poo in here at 55 gallons, then that could be at a point where that would be problematic. But if it's continuing to fill up with clean water coming from your roof, then that's really not that much, especially if we get a two inch rainfall event, it's a lot to kind of clean and self clean and turn out your barrel. Getting the water out, the easiest way to do it is just through a watering can if you want to do that. Uh, you also may want to utilize drip irrigation. Um, so a drip irrigation is the most effective way to water our plants. Um, typically, if we're going to hook up drip irrigation to a rain barrel, though, we want to put a filter on there to make sure that we're cleaning the water so we're not clogging up our drip emitters where the water comes out on our drip irrigation. So these Y strainers right here, they have that yellow 150 micron strainer. It just keeps any debris from getting into your drip irrigation system. Um, you can do this. Uh, definitely, you can hook up some ho soaker hoses if you wanted to do it that way. This is called point source drip irrigation if you wanted to do that. Um, the problem, though, that arises is most drip irrigation, although the water will come out, it doesn't typically come out as evenly as if you were hooking up to a faucet system. And the reason is that drip irrigation is designed from 15 to 20 PSI. It's kind of its, its, its uh, operating range. Um, and the water coming out of your barrel won't nearly be uh, with that force. So just to kind of do some quick calculations here, for every foot of wa water column, we get a 0.433 PSI. And this is some of the same calculations of why they have water towers kind of so high in the air. So rain barrel is only three feet tall. So that means that uh, this barrel, when it's completely full, would only have 1.3 PSI. That's really not a whole lot, right? So it's just kind of coming out uh, fairly slowly where drip irrigation, 15 to 25 PSI, um, it's not gonna come out per manufacturer specifications, but it will water. You can definitely do it um, if you want to. Now, one way we can increase the PSI is putting it on cinder blocks. We recommend raising them 12 to 18 inches. Cinder blocks are you know, about dollar, dollar fifty each. They're relatively inexpensive. One of the reasons that we do that is we can raise uh, every you know, foot, we're raising 1.3 PSI, which is great, um, or you know, 0.433 PSI rather. Um, but the other benefit is if we raise it up a little bit, it just gives us easier access to open the faucet and do what we need to do. If it's exactly on the ground, then it may be a little bit harder to get the water out. Now you'll notice, that we have a little space between the bottom. And the reason that is, if there is any organic matter that fills up, it's just a little bit of soil or dirt or something, it fills up at the bottom, but it settles down, it kind of creates this biofilm, and then you open the water and the faucet is still coming out clean. It's never gonna fill up up here to where it's clogged out or be any problem. But if, if you do have a lot of debris coming in your barrel, you may actually wanna clean it out. But for the most part, we don't have any issue with doing that. Now, we don't want to elevate our barrel too high because if we do, we can actually see this kind of happening here. 
if it is wonky and this weighs a couple hundred pounds, we don't want it to fall over and hurt somebody or break. So we wanna make sure that it is secure if we're raising it with cinder blocks and that it's sturdy. You may actually, you can see here, these people have it strapped against the house. Maybe that may be so a step that you wanna take as well. You don't have to use cinder blocks. You can see here in the picture, um, some people use wood. Uh, you can use all different types of, of materials to raise it up. There's, they've got uh, some that actually hide the barrels themselves. And we do want to get a little more oomph from the water when we're getting it out. You can use a transfer pump. These transfer pumps cost about $50. Uh, they're pretty good. I like to put quick connects on mine. Uh, so it's easy to just kind of quick click them on, use it when I want to, and then I can take it off. Because the problem with these transfer pumps, the more expensive ones are not rated to be outside in freezing weather. So if there's rain storm where water could get in, you can actually put a shield on them, but they're not made to kind of just permanently be outside. So that becomes a little bit problematic. Uh, if you go up to a, a transfer pump that is made to be outside, they're so big and powerful, they zoom the water out of the barrel, which the problem with those transfer pumps is if they run dry, it messes up the pump. So you have to kind of find a solution there. My solution is I use the quick connects. If I need to water my you know, raised bed, then I just put the transfer pump out there. I you know, hook it up to my drip irrigation, I run it. If it's gonna rain, then I bring it inside. Um, there's different ways that you can do that. There's some good YouTube videos that kind of walk it out. If you have any questions, you can reach out to via email. Now, we also have some guides and some publications um, that are on, uh, we're just kind of getting, uh, redoing these, but they'll be on the Water is Awesome website. But you can cover yours in wood if you want to. Um, there's kind of a step-by-step -step on how to do that. Also, anybody know the show Central Texas Gardener comes on PBS? Um, but if you go to their website, there's a segment uh, that we did where we're talking about um, how to cover them with wood if you kind of want to make it look like a, uh, a um, whiskey barrel. Yeah, whiskey barrel. Or there's also a guide in a video we had uh, that kind of walk you through the process step by step if you want to paint it. Um, and that's kind of uh, what we're doing there on Central Texas Garden. So you may want to disguise your barrel and kind of keep cover it up, make it look pretty. You can do that just putting some big plants in front of it if you want. You'll see this barrel in the back there. It's just got some Texas sage there. You can actually paint it to kind of match your home if you want to with a funky color and a rain chain. That one you can see um, sitting behind that shrub. There's a lot of creative people that have done a lot of different things. Just like you're painting anything in the house, I would really spend more time on the prep than you spend painting. When I mean prep, I mean the first thing you want to do is probably going to remove this. You don't have to uh, goof off or goo gone. Both of those work very well to take that, take that sticker right off. And you can also see the secret recipe for making your own favorite soda. Um, and then I like to rough it up. So with sandpaper or a steel wool, just kind of rough it up so the paint has something to stick to. And then clean it with any dish soap. Dish soap and water so make sure it's clean. So we got any residue off of it, we've got it roughed up, we've got it um, uh, soap and water clean, and then it's good to paint. You can use any type of paint that is rated for use on plastic. If you have a special paint that you want to do, and some people do, that's okay. Just use a uh, primer that's rated for use on plastic. Use whatever paint you want, and then you can put a clear coat on top. Um, but did you look through some of the pictures? It's just an incredible, incredible artwork that people have done on the barrel. Most of these people have taken the art classes, and it is remarkable. These people's last name is Barber. I thought that was fun. <laughs> Um, that's my personal favorite right there, R2D2. That one's a little quacky. Or just black looks pretty good. Um, but that is, that's pretty much it. Um, they're, they're actually relatively easy to set up. The main thing is just to, uh, to deliver the water to your barrel, you know, whether it's your gutter, your downspout, or the roof alley. Um, to raise it up a little bit is great to get, uh, increase water pressure and then just ease of use. You can uh, use gravity and watering cans to water anything or you can actually hook it up to a pump and drip irrigation system if you want to go that far. 
Uh, but if anybody has any questions, I'd love to address those now. Uh, if you need to run, I know I tend to talk too much, but the barrels are outside. Um, and you can go and grab your barrel and uh, you know reach out anytime if you have any questions. But does anybody have any questions about anything we've gone over so far? Yeah, do you have to, you mentioned the birds uh, drinking the water on top. Do you got to worry about the mosquitoes? Um, no, so generally right here, and I'll, I'll kind of just pull it closer so, so you can see. But it's really just this lip right here. Um, and typically the water has to be in place for three days before mosquitoes can breed. So this is going to evaporate within three days. And sometimes I actually see butterflies and bees using mine to get a drink. If you have any concerns, some of the barrels already have this done at, uh, at the factory, but they drill a small hole from here to there and that drains the water. So any drill bit, just one hole there is enough to drill it. We don't want to drill into the barrel, but just that lip to drain it if you wanted to. Have you ever seen anybody do, or have you done, you, the use the remaining or the existing downspout gutter, then kind of drill a hole in and put the, use the, the ring chain coming out of that hole? I don't know if that would work. You know what I'm saying? Kind of drill a hole in the, in the downspout so your your water still going out through the gutter. oh yeah there are i haven't seen anybody do that with the rain chain but there are several products that people have that you just drill one hole into your downspout and what it has inside there is a little spoon it's essentially like a little cup and so that goes into the downspout and it's got you know maybe an inch inch and a half inch pipe that comes into your barrel and you can use those. Um, the thing with those are because they're only like, if your downspout is like four inches, right? And it's only catching this much, then if you get just a trickle of water, your barrel is just gonna be, you know, full up to a trickle, but it is less invasive in terms of the downspout. I believe it actually comes with a plug too. So if you want to, take those off. But if you look up, like, uh, if you just Google, like, rain barrel diverter, those will pop up. And I want to say they're like $15. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. You mentioned something about a rain garden or collect something to collect the rain in the ground or soil or slow it's, what are you talking about? There? Yeah, so I actually have, have some more slides and I can go forward, but I was just kind of going over on time. But we can kind of show that. That's what they look like if they're kind of covered up right there. Um, So one of the things that, that we like to do is called landscape CPR. Um, so basically, the C is just conservation. We want to save water. The R is permeability. We want to disconnect those impervious surfaces. And the R is retention. So that's what we're talking about with the rain garden. Um, and so naturally, the water is going to just be shunted off your landscape as quickly as possible. But what we can do is actually make small depressions and so it could be even just a couple of inches. You can put the right plants in there and instead of the water just running off the landscape, it goes into those depressions, that water is allowed to infiltrate. And then when it does fill up, then that water just keeps on going through the same path. You'll notice uh, we're going to Las Vegas next week, but you'll see a lot of that in Arizona and Las Vegas, they have curb cuts. In fact, a lot of new subdivisions, there may even be some around here, they have it to where the water that naturally would be going down the curb can go inside the little health strips or parkways and that fills up with water. So that's one way we're talking, that's kind of what that is pictured there. Um, but you'll notice that many times the plants that are planted there don't need any supplemental irrigation at all if they're the right plants. They just depend on when it rains, the water that comes off the landscape and those and kind of pool up. Now you can't actually engineer rain gardens, and again, we're teaching a class like that uh, next week. Uh, but basically, uh, what we're doing there is we're trying to recreate what we see in an aquifer. A lot of people have heard of aquifer, but they don't realize that the aquifer is really just an area with rocks. Essentially, rocks, different, you know, particulate matter, or gravel, and it's the water, the water in between those spaces of rock where we're actually when we're drilling a well we're getting the water from. And so that's what we've created in a rain garden. With a rain garden, a true rain garden that's engineered, 
you would dig out a hole of water. You'd go back with rocks that actually will help um, like permeate, allow that water to infiltrate. And then you put compost on the top of that. That's what this mid layer is. Compost works like a sponge. It allows a lot of water to infiltrate quickly and then it holds on to that water during periods of time. So this is kind of your aquifer on the bottom. You've got your compost, which is your kind of spongy layer, your regular soil on the top, and then the plants that are planted on the edge are kind of your lower water users. The plants that plant in the middle are your higher water users. So that's kind of just the basics. But again, we are teaching a class where I'll dig deep into all that um, during the rest of it. But that's kind of what a rain garden looks like by design. A lot more potential to harvest rainwater in the ground than in a rain barrel. Does it matter if we do it on one side of the house or the other side of the house? A rain garden? Yeah. You can do it anywhere. I generally we recommend people doing it 10 to 15 feet away from your foundation just so as that water infiltrates it's not causing any issues. One of the main things we want to do is keep our foundations evenly moist um, but not completely dry and not completely wet. So a lot of irrigation systems actually run entirely about a foot away from your foundation. So you can run it if you ever start to see that gap kind of spreading out away from there. Um, and what we, the other thing we don't want to do is for water to kind of flow against your home if your home is here and that to build up wet. So the rain garden should be always draining away from your home, at least 10, 15 feet. But yeah, certainly you can do it on any side of your home. Uh, I, I noticed that, I thought it pointed out it happens in my house. Our, uh, like most houses, it kind of drains down, the water drains down away from the house. So we're in the, the yard, we put a, uh, what do you call it? A Bridge drain? Not even a drain, it's like, we built up our uh, raised bed, mm -hmm. it's like a flower bed. Uh -huh. So we put a you know, boundary around it, and the water just builds up right up against, because it's, it's going down this way, and yeah. then the rock comes, the stone comes up above the water, you have to put, you have to put it up, so the water builds up right over there. And then it goes away. So I guess on that is already happening. Yeah, as long as it's not staying, you know, next to your home, you know, you know, really, you know, six, 12 hours is the most that we would want to see that. And then if it goes away, it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, one of the best things is, you know, to go out and read waters, actually go with an umbrella when it's raining and see if there's any problems. There are companies that specialize specifically in that. There are different ways that they could do that, whether it's like engineering with a French drain or more like passive with something like a rain garden, but both are effective. Any other questions? Yeah, is there any reason I should not put like a potted plant on top of that on the part that's not open? No, it's fine. Okay. Yeah, I mean, just make sure that it's kind of sturdy and in place. You wouldn't want it to kind of slip down and like make a hole in here. And if it's set for a couple of weeks, the mosquitoes can breed. But as long as it's sturdy, sure. <clears throat> We've seen some people put a little bit of like gravel on the top too. Some people have put like recycled glass. And there's a lot of different options, but there's some barrels that actually come pre-made as uh, like pots on the top. But I priced them out for a client, and you know, a lot of those are kind of in the two to three hundred dollar range, which yeah. is pretty cool. Can you take that build it forward one slide? I think it was. Yeah. Yeah, but one of the things that, that we try to recommend is once you have rainwater, you really want to make sure that you're using that water effectively so it goes further. One thing that you can do is reduce your turf grass areas. Um, so typically turf grass is going to use the most water. So if we can minimize the turf grass areas, we're being more efficient with our water resources. So typically that means extending our flower beds with our uh, perennial trees, shrubs, um, just flowers. And then we can also increase our pervious areas. So when we say pervious, we just mean areas that have like paved stone or flagstone or decomposed granite, gravel. These could be pathways, these could be borders around the house. Um, they could be actually destinations that we're using. We're walking the path to take out the trap. We're walking the path to you know, go to the vegetable garden. We may put a bench in a pretty area, shaded area in our landscape where maybe the butterflies like to hang out. We put a path going there. Uh, but race, basically it's just trying to infiltrate the water when it is raining and then it absorbs through the ground and our plants aside there will take advantage. 
rain gardens are certainly a part of that, but some also dry riverbeds or some mulch beds. beds. Sure, yeah, mulch beds absorb water as well. There we go. Those are those are pertinent. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Good deal. All right. Well, we can head out. You know, if you uh, go grab.